Hi, welcome to Reality Check. My guest today is Paul Agapo. Uh, Paul is the data science director in uh, biomedical research. And this is absolutely new field to me. I'm, I have absolutely no idea uh, what's happening with, with regards to Gen AI and biopharma. So Paul is going to be our guide in this complicated world. Paul, uh, can you introduce yourself and uh, let's start our journey learning about Gen AI and the biomedical research and uh, drug discovery? Thank you. Yeah. Yes, as uh, said, I'm Paul Agapow. I'm a, I'm a one-time immunologist, one-time biochemist who has since been tempted completely over to the dark side into data science and AI. And I, uh, I currently work for a big pharmaceutical company here in sunny tropical London, doing all sorts of things in connection with clinical trials, drug development, and so forth. Um, excellent. So um, how did you end up uh, moving from immunologist to the data scientist? So what, what motivated you to change the job so radically? Ha! Oh, well, that's part of my dark secret there. So once upon a time, I did spend all my time at a laboratory bench wearing a lab coat, uh, mixing colored chemicals with other colored chemicals, growing things in Petri dishes. Uh, but as sometimes happens, we had a a terrible uh, project uh, failure, uh, a line of research that just completely collapsed. And at that point, I started thinking, what am I going to do to make money? And so I, uh, I went and I did myself a computer science qualification and found that just then, at that particular moment in the, uh, the mid-90s, there was this tipping point where biological research was moving from being largely experiment bound, kind of laboratory bound, uh, wet laboratory bound, to moving into being effectively a data science in there. And I was just there at the right moment to take advantage of that, uh, running into lots of biologists who said, you're just the person we need. We need someone who can understand computers. And now, many years later, here I am. Uh, interesting. It turns out many scientists step on this butterfly and uh, their life gets changed uh, completely. So they get um, pulled into the world of computers and data. Uh, this is exciting. So let me ask you this question. Uh, when you introduce the world of biopharma and uh, drug research, uh, what are the big whales, big white whales? What are the key problems that uh, the industry is um, uh, trying to solve these days? Okay, so uh, the world of drug development is a very strange one, and it has to be explained a little bit to people. So if I was to give uh, a very short summary, I would say developing a drug is like walking into a casino with $100 million dollars and slapping it down on the roulette table and saying, put it on the zero and let's go. Uh, drug development is a very long, very random, very chancy process in there. You'll often see these pictures of drug development where they visualize it as being almost like a funnel. In one end, you put uh, maybe a thousand, ten thousand possible drugs, what we call drug candidates, things that might do some good to people if we turn them into a therapy. And then they move through a series of stages. They go through preclinical testing. They go through a series of clinical trials, each time with a high rate of attrition. And 10 years later and $2 billion later, we'll come out with one drug at the end. So they call this process sometimes the valley of death. And it's a process that's dominated by chance, taking bets, and hoping that they'll pay off in the future. So in order to pay in that arena, play in that arena, rather, uh, you have to have a lot of money, a lot of patience, and a very healthy appetite for risk. So... The big whales in there, in fact, there is kind of the whale 
as an abstract problem, which is how do we tilt the odds towards us? I don't think anyone believes we can ever completely solve this process and go from here's a drug we can 100% make this work in a person. It is definitely a question of how do we shave a couple of percent off here or there to just tilt the odds in our favor? Because you'll end up with a lot of problems in there, the problems that dominate this randomness, like, you know, this drug seemed to work well in the laboratory, but it does nothing when we get into a person, or it's too expensive to manufacture, or it has terrible side effects, or, 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 or. A lot of these things that are very much difficult to predict, and difficult to control in the process. So the big whale, as it would be, is how do we shift those odds in there? How do we make better bets? Interesting. Uh, and since we're talking about um, billions of dollars, nobody likes to play roulette with that amount of money. So mm -hmm. obviously the pharmaceutical companies will use whatever tools they can find to save uh, uh, this much money. Mm -hmm. And uh, as we were saying at Microsoft, billion dollar here, billion dollar there, and sooner or later you start talking about some serious money. So mm -hmm. um, what's your view, how Gen AI uh, is seen um, and how it can help to the pharma to save these billions of dollars? Mm -hmm. Well, the pharmaceutical industry certainly does have this tendency to latch on to what someone's called the disruptor du jour. What's the thing that's going to save the pharmaceutical industry this year? And, you know, there's been a long history of these things. And just general AI, of course, is being hailed as one. And if we go back far enough, we'll come through to various, you know, gene technologies and so forth that people said was going to completely change things. But now that Gen AI is here, there is this general air of excitement in the pharmaceutical industry. But perhaps slightly a feeling of, well, where will we use this then? So here's a way of looking at it. The pharmaceutical industry, in a sense, is the ultimate data-driven industry. It's an industry that takes data. It takes its own historical data. It takes chemical data. It takes data from its own experiments and uses those to hone a drug product or therapy and outputs Yet again, more data, the results of clinical trials, the results of toxicity tests, so on and so forth. So Gen AI being this very data hungry technology, where could this fit in? Now, I think we might split it into the use cases into the obvious and the not so obvious there. And the obvious one is generating new possible drugs. Okay. So way back at the beginning of drug development, there is this stage where we generate what we call candidate drugs, possible molecules that we might look at taking forward. And so Gen AI is a way of generating more candidates for us there. Okay. So... You know, we might say, look at all the candidates we have so far, look at what you can learn about them, which ones have been successful, which ones have been not so successful. Okay, can you give us more in there? And there are many, many companies out in the industry there, big farmers and startups and so forth, that are promising to generate more of these candidate drugs, okay, by the use of Gen AI. Now, that is the obvious application. And in some ways, what I think is the least interesting application because, <clears throat> because of a couple of things. Number one is that many drug companies have far more drug candidates than they know what to do with. As a, as a chemist, a uh, very senior chemist at a big pharma company told me years ago, he said, you know, I can't work with another thousand possible drug candidates. We don't have time to test all of those. Give me five good ones. 
And that prioritization picture that these are necessarily better picture is not something that a field gen AI has yet made a convincing case for in that context. There's also, you know, we might look at the rest of the drug development cycle and say, well, is this really helping things? It takes you around about 10 years to develop a drug, as I said. And if we were to have more candidates, well, we might shave maybe a year, maybe two off there. Okay, so not a great advantage, not a disruption, we might say. Um, <clears throat> the uh, the respected drug development chemist, John Overington, once said that, you know, very often these AI solutions will swan in and promise that they will slash development time. But when you look at it, actually, it's only taking a couple of months of your development cycle. And, you know, finally, there is a problem that I think is inherent to Gen AI in a very particular way, in that it is in many ways telling you about what you know, but not what you don't know. So if you have a look at Gen AI solutions that have been applied to the chemical space, to the drug space, very often you'll find that they're quite interesting and quite good at telling you more and predicting more about particular families of chemicals or activities or so forth that you already know well about okay but disruptions actually actually often come from moving into new spaces and new categories of things so forth and in those areas it's not so good but let's be positive and let's talk about the things possibly that it can really help us with and as i said pharmaceuticals is very much a data driven industry so it can help us many ways with that there is an incredible amount of documentation and so forth required in the development of drugs. Regulatory documents, statistical plans, things that have to be crafted and created and have to be exact and correct and so forth. And so if we can get Gen AI to actually help us make these things in a faster way, we can vastly improve the productivity of our workers working in that space and you know make no mistake pharmaceutical companies have entire armies of people whose jobs are basically to write documents in there there's a lower version of that as well okay in that of course there is the marketing information and information for doctors and patients and so forth that also pharmaceutical companies make a lot of and it can ease that along but there's one other area that I think that is very intriguing, and that's to do with the idea of unstructured data. Now, anyone who's worked in computer science and AI and so forth knows that the vast majority of the world's information is trapped in what we call unstructured data, data that's not in a particular formal format. Okay, It is not well formed. It is not well laid out. It's not in a spreadsheet. It's just written in a document or something like that. And health data is exactly the same. The vast majority of the world's information out there as regards health data is trapped in doctor's notes, letters. It's in x-rays that aren't annotated particularly well. It's in all the little comments and annotations and everything like that that happen from every particular appointment which happened there. Now, if we can harvest that information, that is a literal bonanza of biomedical information that we can use for everything. We can use it to inform basic research. We can use this to help us tell what patients actually look like, or <clears throat> we can actually use this to help identify patients in the hospital records. And then there's a, a very exciting case put out by a, a local startup company here where they're using Gen AI to actually help them sift through hospital records and find misdiagnosed patients because doctors will make mistakes, doctors will code things incorrectly, so forth, and they've been able to find a vast population of patients hidden away in the hospital records. So these patients can be 
put into a clinical trial. They can be diagnosed correctly. We can use them to learn more about the conditions that they have. Well, um, uh, interesting. I didn't want to interrupt you because you <laughs> are very structured in your presentation and thought <laughs> process. Uh, I admire that. So uh, basically, I see two things. One is uh, doing a lot of back office support. Uh, mm -hmm. So everything non-research related, uh, uh, marketing, documentation, uh, regulations, um, based documentation, all that can be outsourced to AI. Yeah. Uh, and the second thing is dealing with the patient data, uh, which is uh, in the unstructured uh, text um, uh, form. My concern is that all the patient data is so guarded. Uh, there are so many regulations that prevent accessing this data. Um, what's your experience? How do we deal with that? Uh, how do we, on one hand, use that knowledge that's there uh, to train the models and to educate the AI. And uh, on the other hand, um, be compliant with GDPRs of the world and uh, be uh, careful uh, and ethical in the use of AI. You know, that's, mm, that is a difficult question earlier. And I, my short answer would be very carefully. Uh, my longer answer is I think there are multiple axes here we have to think along. Uh, one of them is in how these solutions are deployed. And I know that many of these solutions, when we have looked at how can we get them in in a secure and governed way, very often it will require dealing with these things at an arm's length. For example, you know, a pharmaceutical company may not actually, or a set of researchers may not actually be able to directly query information in a hospital. But if they are able to ask the hospital to query that information for them, that can be done in a governed and contained way. Uh, and of course, obviously, researchers would love to just sift through directly, but this is what's required often to use these tools, that you have to deploy them within firewalled, sealed environments. A phrase they love to hear use here in the UK is walled gardens, if you will. Uh, the second thing is that there is always a balance between the security or the anonymization that you put on records and how much information you're able to get out of them. So there are Many companies now who will sell you, so, well, they won't sell you, they'll sell you access to uh, anonymized patient records. If you look at someone like, say, Flatiron Health in the United States, you can get access there to 22 million cancer patients in the United States. And they go through that data very carefully to ensure that it is, you know, thoroughly anonymous, okay, and does not breach any guidelines. Having said that, the question of bias is a very poignant one in the area of drug development healthcare. There's a bad history of that in healthcare and drug development. Um, some people might have heard of, you know, there are particular drugs that are developed that when uh, we look at their action actually in the real world, they don't perform well in particular populations, uh, famously cardiac drugs in African-Americans. Uh, and this is because when we're developing drugs, very often we're doing that on populations of patients that are not typical. Okay, So when you're testing something, you'll be testing it against particular population and where does that population come from and very often when you're looking at uh, the patients that you use in these things there will be patients with uncomplicated cases of diseases okay they have that disease and nothing else with them or they're people that live close to a university uh, research center and so forth so when you go to employ it in the real world that's a real problem and 
I think this has been highlighted quite well when people have tried to use Gen AI solutions for, say, diagnosis or for understanding patient populations. What the Gen AI solutions appear to be doing is that they have ingested or assumed the biases of their training data there and the people who have constructed those systems. So I don't know that there is a great solution to that other than to just be very constantly aware of who was this system built from, what data was it constructed from, and where you were actually using it. You know, and then we come to a word that I love to use which, use, which is validation or benchmarking. Any of these solutions have to be validated and benchmarked and monitored constantly for their performance, because otherwise we're just crossing our fingers and hoping that things will work. Yeah, very good. So it looks like, uh, <clears throat> according to the Bible, God created humans in its own image, and now we are creating um, AI models in our own image with our own flaws and biases. Um, Actually, absolutely. As I said, it's, it's remarkable when you start to address the issue of bias in medical research, where you know, it doesn't require an explicit bias or a thinking bias in there. There's quietly bias creeps into our analyses and our data unless we're constantly vigilant for it. Yeah, we need to create the model that will analyze the bias and do nothing else. Yeah, that's good. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, when we talk about the actual implementations uh, of um, Gen AI, you mentioned one uh, for um, uh, analyzing uh, the um, uh, uh, the diagnosis uh, of the people. So any other interesting use cases that you see recently deployed? Uh, certainly there's been, of course, if you look at the, the number of large models, uh, that have been developed out there. There's a bewildering cacophony of them. Uh, but the ones that interest me quite a lot are the ones that have been trained on medical literature. And um, because, as I said, there's this large body of unstructured information out there, and one large body of that is, of course, the research literature. Now, if you try to understand absolutely everything there is about, say, Alzheimer's, or asthma, or any other common condition. It's difficult. Once upon a time, scientists and academics would say something like, I'll spend one morning a week reading all the latest papers. And that's impossible now. There is too much happening. There are too many theories being generated, data being generated, rejected and retracted, and new developments and, and so forth. Could Gen AI help us to master this, to tunnel through this data there. And I have a slight prejudice here because uh, early in my career, I did try and solve this problem with just good old fashioned text extraction, NLP, as was needed. And anyone who has ever worked in this area knows how that is such an imperfect science. Uh, very often people will talk about accuracy rates of 60% in extracting terms from medical papers in there. Now, Gen AI, uh, it may or may not actually be doing better in mining these terms or identifying things within literature. There's some conflicting results about that, but it can get you there a lot faster. And as opposed to the days where you have to hand roll a model and very carefully sort of tweak it and tune it and see what it was doing. Gen AI models, they help us get there a lot faster. And so we can pull out things like symptoms and particular diseases, chemical names, things like that, things that there used to be companies in the past who were dedicated to doing this by hand. Okay? They'd have a, an army of PhDs sitting there reading papers and underlining things and highlighting things. And now Gen AI can help us get there almost overnight. And this offers us a great opportunity to actually mine and understand the scientific literature. 
which has now just moved so beyond any human mind. Yeah, uh, my concern is that um, it will work on both sides. So I expect that researchers will be using Gen AI to um, uh, write these articles um, <laughs> using the small synopsis that they pro provided. And on the other side, uh, there will be consumers of this information decomposing these articles back to the original synopsis. I share your concern. I, <laughs> it, you know, it's from that. It's like only one to step to where do the humans actually <laughs> need to be in this loop? I, you know, already we have a problem with uh, paper mills, as they're called in the academic literature, where there are clearly these shadowy businesses who will basically they'll write a scientific paper for you, uh, generating the results and the data to get you the results that you want. You know, what happens when they get their hands onto Gen AI? Um, I think it's going to be an arms race there to detect what's genuine papers, what's genuine results, and what is effectively fake. I wonder if it's possible to build the model that will recognize with a certain degree of certainty this type of generated data fake um, articles. Um, it, it might be an interesting application. I think it would be. I, I believe there are applications already that people use to uh, recognize fake images that are in scientific papers and pick up things. And, of course, we have systems to detect where the students are turning in essays that have been generated by chat GPT. So it seems that it just needs kind of the next step to connect those two up. Perfect. So if... If you will be, if I'll ask you for advice um, for the startups that are working in the Gen AI field, mm -hmm. is there one particular whale number one uh, problem that they will be um, solving for pharmaceutical companies uh, to be successful uh, in this field? Hmm. That's an interesting one. And if I had a solid answer, maybe I'd set that company up myself. But I would say rather than chase the thing that everyone else is chasing, generating drugs, there are two things you could do. You could use generative AI to better predict which drugs are going to have toxic effects or side effects. And currently there is no AI system that will do this for you, like none. And that is one of the primary causes of the failure of drug development uh, when they get into late development. Someone comes up with something that should work and it's put into clinical trials and often very late after a lot of time and a lot of money, it is basically, it is unusable in a patient okay, because of these toxicity effects. If someone could mine the literature on toxicity and so forth and do some predictive uh, abilities about this drug is likely to have an off-target effect, that could be used to de-risk a lot of clinical trials and save a lot of money and time. Interesting. So we had been talking about the drug development. Uh, is there a whale number one in cl clinical trials? Because clinical trials is another big area that we didn't touch through our conversation. But mm. I bet uh, uh, this is also a cumbersome and lengthy and regulated process. It absolutely is. It absolutely is very bound by documents, very down, bound by processes as well. So putting aside the idea of you know, generating those documents and reading those documents and so forth, and... If you've ever seen the specification for a clinical trial, you'll understand just how massive it is. There's also just understanding the clinical data. Now, clinical data tends to be stored in uh, very particular strict regulated forms because they have to be. It's a regulatory thing. We need them to be understand by understood by computers and so forth. But it's actually, it's not easy for humans to use. So you will very often during a clinical trial, if you want to know what's going on, it's an arduous process to get that data that's been gathered and to translate it in a form that you can understand and say, okay, that's what our current state of affairs is. 
Gen AI being very good at translating data formats and extracting data and so forth would be superb for these just-in-time interrogations, if you will. Uh, and I know that there are a couple of instances where people have been looking at building infrastructures to better understand clinical data. Great. Well, um, now it's time for a question from my previous uh, <laughs> guest. And the question is, so far we've seen Gen AI being a supporting tool uh, for us, uh, doing the work um, like back office work that uh, you mentioned, uh, uh, helping us with things that we don't like to do ourselves. And I see Gen AI as being a, uh, a support personnel, your personal assistant to some degree. So when do you think uh, Gen AI will move from being an assistant dealing with the existing knowledge base to a researcher creating and generating the new knowledge? Hmm. Okay, and my answer to that would be that I don't, not in the short term. And, and let me explain that for my own particular field, that I like to think anything that you deploy, there are three axes that you have to think about. One is the probability of it making a mistake. Okay. And, you know, we're well aware that Gen AI solutions, you know, hallucinate at times as inevitable. It comes to the ground, they will extrapolate and some of their extrapolations will be incorrect. The second thing is the impact of that mistake. So if I'm writing some marketing material for some patients or something like that, the possibility of that mistake is not great because I can check that easily, so forth. Uh, obviously, if I'm putting in a regulatory document or something like that, the impact of that mistake is much greater. But there is the third one, which is how long is it going to take you to find that mistake in there? And my suspicion is that with many things in the drug development area, you only find out your mistakes many, many years afterwards. Uh, that that road to validation is very long. Uh, so I think it's going to take another advance in there to do these things for us. But at the current moment, I don't believe the system, the way it works and its appetite for risk can quite absorb any autonomous Gen AI system. Uh, the road to seeing whether, whether, whether one is wrong or not is far too long. Great. And now uh, it's an opportunity for you to ask the question to my next uh, speaker. Mm -hmm. Okay. So given, since we're talking about mistakes that Gen AI make, given the various mistakes and uh, people talk hallucinations, the errors that one can trick Gen AI systems into. What is a faculty or facility you would give a Gen AI system that would really boost its usability, really make, really make it do something that is far more interesting and radical? Cool. Well, cool. Thank you so much. I don't know how about you, but for me, it was extremely educational and super useful. I thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. Excellent. Thank you, Elia. I love to talk about this. It's a pleasure to talk to you too. Same here. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, guys, don't forget to subscribe to the channel so you will not miss um, the future interviews. And uh, if you have a story to tell, to share about the use of Gen AI, don't hesitate to reach out. Thanks. Bye-bye.